Well, good evening, everybody. Merry Christmas. It's such a joy to be with you, whether in the room or online. And if you're online, you might have been smart to do that this evening. I don't know. You might have a seat at home. But it's such a joy to be with you on this evening to worship Jesus and to celebrate Christmas together. And from my family to yours, we just want to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. This is most, well, actually, this is all of our tribe. I say most. This is all of them, all that I know of. Um, but I'd actually like to invite my three oldest daughters out on stage. They're going to help me tonight with a little bit of the first part of this message. So if you would, welcome Lily and Lucy and Layla. Tonight on stage, other than these beautiful little girls... We kind of have four elements on the stage tonight that I'd love to share just a few moments with you about. First, we have a manger, and we have a cross, we have four gifts, and a star. And you might go, are those the points of your message? What in the, how long? No. But these elements tonight, I think they truly do speak of Christmas. And tonight, I want to share a little bit with you about how the manger and the cross make Christmas very merry for you and for me. And how the manger and the cross make these gifts that we're going to open up in just a few moments, they make them ours. I hope you get that tonight. And I'll share a little bit more about these gifts, but before we do, let's go ahead and open them and see what they are. So Layla Love, are you ready? Okay, let's open up that first gift. Layla is opening the gift of joy. Joy. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. This is what it writes. This is what it says. The angels, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born this day in Bethlehem, the city of David. There's joy at Christmas. All right, Lucy Lynn Bailey, what you got? Love. Ooh, I like that one. You know, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Everyone knows John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Well, 1 John 3, 16 says this about the love of God. John writes, we know what real love is. Why? Because Jesus gave his life for us. All right, Lily Jane, let's open up that third gift. Peace, peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we have been made right with God, because of our faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And I'll open up the fourth. We do actually have a fourth daughter in our tribe. But, and we practiced, and it just didn't work out. So I thought, you know, six months is a little too early. I'll do this last one. I'll open up the gift of hope. Hope. And listen to what the Word of God says. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, Speaking of Jesus, we have this hope. Who is he speaking of, church? Well, almost. It rhymes with Mises, and it starts with a J. Okay, let's try this again. We have this hope, and who is this hope, church? Jesus. You got the answer right on Christmas. You passed the test. That's right. We have this hope, Jesus, and he is the anchor for our soul. Now, these girls were very nervous to be up here, but girls, you're all done. Why don't you give them a round of applause, girls? You can go back to your spot. Now, I don't want to take too much of your time. I recognize that it's crowded. I'm sure you've got pigs in a blanket to either make or eat tonight. But I do want to say this, and I hope that you hear this. Christmas is about celebrating the reality that God, who had faithfully promised for thousands of years to send a Savior, hear me on this, that God is faithful to fulfill His promises. And at Christmas, 
We see that God is not just a promise maker, but He's a promise keeper. He doesn't disappoint. And His Son was born in Bethlehem. His cradle was a manger. And on this stage this evening, we have four things. A manger, a cross, the gifts, and a star. And I want to share with you for just a few moments why these matter so much to you. Father, I ask and pray as we just spend a few moments together this evening, Lord, that I would be able to serve your people well. Jesus, that you would be the center of our celebration and time at Christmas. And Lord, that our hearts would be warm to your truth so that we could shine brightly to a world that is lost and desperately needs to know the hope, the mercy, the love, the grace, the joy, the peace that you and you alone offer. I pray that in the only name that's ever mattered, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray. Amen. Four things on the stage tonight. A manger. Why a manger? Well, there were some answers in that video. I like those answers. I thought they were good that the kids made. But you've probably heard the story of Jesus' parents, Joseph and Mary. They were in Bethlehem. And the only place available to stay, well, it's kind of like, Christmas Eve at Coastline. The only place was the parking lot. That was the only spot they got to go. They were in the stable. That, that's where the, the, the mode of transportation was of that day. The donkeys, the horses. And the manger was the feeding pen for the animals. And that's where they laid Jesus. Listen to the words that Luke records for us in Luke chapter 2. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. See, here's what's so amazing to me. Since the third chapter of Genesis, the first chapter in all of the Bible where sin is finally mentioned, God begins to make a promise. I will send a Savior. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years pass in preparation for this Messiah, this anointed one, the one who's to come and to save God's people. It's like they're waiting on the tip of their toes from the prophets, the Jewish people are. For thousands of years, waiting for the arrival, the coming, the birth of the Messiah who was foretold and anticipated. And when he finally arrives... He's born in a cave. You say, a cave? I thought you said a stable. Modern day stables in that time were caves, dark and damp. And they laid him in the place where the animals ate. Why a manger? Why does that matter to us? See, listen to me. Let me me see your eyes if I can. God, sending his son Jesus, rather than come as kind of a well, maybe a pampered or a privileged ruler, the king of kings comes humbly. His first bed was a manger. What does this say to us about Jesus? You know what? If you don't have zip code envy, if you don't live in the right spot, if you don't have the right last name or the right threads on, you're out out, out of luck. No. This is what it says to you and me about Jesus. Jesus is available to you. He's approachable. He's approachable, He's available, He's accessible. I need you to know this, that God doesn't just love the world, God actually likes you. He created you. He knows you. He cares about you. God sent His Son, yes, through prophecies that were foretold, yes, with angels and shepherds in the the hillside and, and bright lights, all of that is true, but where did they lay Him? In a place where you could access Him. A place where you could approach Him. A place where He's available to you. God loves you so much that He gave His gracious, perfect baby, Son, one and only begotten, so that you could have a right relationship with Him. Why a manger? Because God wants you to have this understanding firm in your heart. He's for you. He's available to you. He's accessible. That's why a manger. But why a cross? Listen, if our greatest need in life had been information, we would have had an educator. If our greatest need in life, someone once said, was technology, 
God would have sent us a scientist, or maybe Elon Musk, right, if that was our greatest need. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. But since our greatest need in life is forgiveness, God sent a Savior. A Savior. And it's on the cross that Jesus hung, bled, and died for your sins and mine. And Christmas, Christmas is about the gift. God's Son, Jesus, who gave His life for you and for me on the cross. Why the cross? Listen to the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 9, verse 22. He said, The Son of Man must suffer terrible things. He'll be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day, He will be raised from the dead. Why a manger? Why a cross? It's in the manger that we see That God both showed and shared with you and with me that He's available to you. We live in one of the most informed and connected generations of humanity. And yet also the loneliest. Perhaps the most insecure to introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Fear of rejection plagues so many. You need to know this. God loves you and He likes you. He knows you. He came in a manger. He's accessible to you. Why a manger? You're loved. You're wanted. You're not too far gone. Listen, God came in a manger to meet people where they were. And God through the manger and through tonight, He'll meet you right where you are. But He loves you so much, He doesn't want you to stay where you are. That's why the cross It's through the cross that Jesus satisfies what's really at the top of our Christmas list this year. The need, the longing, the the desire to be made whole. To be right with God. And to actually have a way to be right with others. It's through the cross that Jesus paid for our sins. And He opened to us these gifts that we opened tonight. See, these four gifts of hope and joy, love and peace are gifts that are given. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. If you're a believer, these are gifts that you own. Hope, joy, peace, love. They've been given to you. Let them have their stay. Don't let them go. And these gifts can be opened and enjoyed every day because of this day, Christmas. See, the gift of hope Biblical hope is not wishful thinking, but it's confident expectation. Think of it this way. Hope without Jesus is wishing upon a star. Hope with Jesus is knowing the one who created the star. I know that guy. My confident expectation is in him. The Bible describes hope in this way, Philippians 1.6. Paul writes this. I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he might pull through. No. No. He will complete it. God's not done with you. Listen to the author of Hebrews speaking of hope. We've we've read this before tonight already. We have this hope. Jesus. He's the anchor of our soul. Listen to what the Bible says about those that have, well, hope without Jesus. Job chapter 8, verse 13. The author writes this. The hopes of the godless evaporate. Their confidence hangs by a thread. It's like they're leaning on a spider's web. See, the only place hope has true meaning really is the meaning of Christmas. That because of the manger and because of the cross, we can have confidence. Like Paul would write to those Christians in Philippi, listen, God is not done with you. That's not just a pithy saying or a pep talk on Christmas Eve. This is the truth of the Word of God. God's not done with you. He's got wonderful plans for you. There's hope secured in Christ. And even when this life passes, there's hope beyond the grave. There's hope beyond the grave. You know, that truth should change the way your face looks. Do you know what I mean by that? That I have a hope that no matter what God is doing, I can trust Him. You know, you, you met 50% of my kids this evening. 
Lily, Lucy, and Layla. Well, there's also Liam and Leo and Lainey. And, and one of my kids to me, uh, said to me this, uh, this afternoon as we were walking around, there were a lot of things going on. We, we had some people show up to Christmas Eve. We didn't have enough chairs. I don't know if you noticed. But, and someone said, how come you're not freaking out? I said, you know, God knows. God knows. He knows my end from my beginning. I can trust him no matter what happens. And see, this leads to that second gift, joy. You could say there's different types of joy in life, a temporary happiness and an eternal one. Solomon, arrayed with more wisdom and more wealth than any other human being recorded in history, found the world's brand of happiness to be lacking. Listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes. He said, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find what is good. But I also found that this proved to be meaningless, to live life for me. See, the joy of the world is hollow, doesn't last. But the joy of the Lord is rich and abundant. The world's happiness fades with time, but God's people have joy that endures forever. In Isaiah chapter 35, the author writes this, Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy, will crown their heads in gladness and joy, will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Listen, because of Christmas, we can have a joy that's permanent, that no matter what happens today, I'm still headed to heaven. And you know, I found this interesting. I did a lot of reading on joy this week, and I found this statement to be ever so true. There's no such thing as glum joy. We cannot drain joy of emotion and call it joy. When God's Spirit gives us joy, there's an element where that's apparent to others. There's a sense of happiness to your steps. The gift of love. See, love involves both emotion and motion. It's difficult to put into words. But you know when you love something, it's all you think about, it's all you talk about. If you come to our house, you'll see that little Leonidas Ulysses, that dude loves trains. Those things are everywhere and it's all he talks about. But love that lasts is not just emotional. It involves motion. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, the Word of God records this to us about God's love. By this we know love. We can know what it is. It's evidenced in this because He laid down His life for us. See, God's love is giving, sacrificial, unconditional, eternal, comforting, and life-giving. Listen, we're almost done. I just don't want you to miss this. Because of the manger, because of the cross, you get to open up and experience real love every day. You don't have to go looking for love in all the wrong places. It's not going to be found there. You find true love in the manger and at the cross. This last gift, peace. You know what's so interesting about the, the angelic announcement? This, this whole dynamic of Christmas? Peace is a primary focus of Christmas. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, it was announced by the angels. Peace on earth. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Isaiah had predicted that the Messiah would be the prince of what? Do you know, church? Peace. Wow, you're still awake. That's amazing. In 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Jesus is called the Lord of peace. I'm not that smart, but I know this, that if the Bible says that, hey, he's the Lord of peace, that's where I go to get my peace. If I'm going to anything or anyone or any place else and expecting peace, I'm not going to the Lord of it. I need to go to Jesus. Romans 5.1 says that we have peace with God because of the cross and the empty tomb. Philippians 4.7 says that the peace of God has this ability, like nothing else, to guard, like a, like a military soldier, your heart and your mind. Because of the manger, because of the cross, you and I have these gifts of hope, love, joy, and peace. 
You see, tonight, we see that it's in a manger, but that's where God meets us. He's available. He's approachable. He's accessible. It's through the cross that we understand that God meets our greatest need, not to be wealthy, but to be forgiven and to be made right, and to enjoy the gifts of hope, joy, love, and peace. There's a secret to it. And to share it with you, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to invite the men that are going to help us tonight in lighting the candles and the band to come forward. But I don't want you to miss this. I go ahead and take mine. I don't want you to miss this. It's through the manger that we see that God is available to us. How many of you would say that's good news? Say that's good news if that's good news. Jesus is available to you. It's through the cross that God has forgiven us. If that's good news, let me hear you say that's good news. But here's the deal. At Christmas, we look back to his first coming and celebrate. Oh, God made good on his promises. He sent his son. For believers who've read the end of the book, the Bible, we know that he is coming again as one to rule and to reign. But also listen to me. Let me see your eyes. Don't miss this. He wants to come and meet you in this moment called life. And life is not meant to be lived lovelessly, without peace, without joy, without hope. That's not why Jesus hung on a cross for you. So so that you would live miserably through life. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says that the kingdom of God, the lifestyle, is a life of joy, of peace, of hope. And I believe this with every fiber of my being. If the Gulf Coast of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, had all these human beings who walked around like like almost new humans that had this love and this joy and this peace because it was securely found in their right relationship with God, this world would change. See, here's the deal. There's a manger on this stage. Yeah, there's a cross. There's four gifts, but there's also a star. There's a star. Why the star? You know that that night that the angels announced that Jesus was born, the night's heaven lit up and it must have looked like a million stars. There were angels there, but that wasn't the Christmas star. See, the Christmas star, the star of Bethlehem, known in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, as his star, was a sign to the men from the east that prompted and guided them to find Jesus. And they followed that light. And this is my encouragement to you as we're about to light these candles. That's your job as believers. To light the way and point the way so that others can find that Lord of peace. That one who brings joy. That one who actually gives hope. Listen, the gift that hung on that tree beats any gift that's coming under these trees tomorrow morning. Jesus, to know him and to make your life about others knowing him, listen, that's where you find it. That's where you find hope and joy and peace and you experience love to the fullest. It's not saying, oh Lord, give me these gifts, give me these gifts. It's saying, Lord, I want to light the way so that others can have hope. Others can experience peace. Others can have joy. And here's the tricky thing about being a Christian. It's when you let go that you finally have. It's when you die that you finally are alive. It's when you stop living for yourself and live for Him and them. Where you say, I finally have peace. Finally there's joy. Because it's not about me. It's about Him. And it's about them. And that's the secret of walking with Jesus. You may say, why as a, as a believer do I, I never seem to have hope and peace and joy. Give it away. Give it away. One of my Bible professors used to tell me, Neil, the problem with blessing for many of us is we're blessed and we're, we hoard it. And that's what makes us miserable. But to truly experience the joy of the Lord is to be one who constantly gives, constantly gives, constantly gives. For that's who God is on Christmas. He gave His one and only begotten Son. 